don't think that all of the answers to all of the problems in the world are found in the Bible. I know it might, must sound that way after a while on Sunday morning, but we're not going to get through this current crisis just by reading the Bible. There are no rules and laws in there that are going to solve this all for us. But still, there is a foundation there. There's a foundation there for ways of thinking about ourselves and thinking about the earth around us um, that can be part of the solution. Because it comes to us, the Bible comes to us from a very different world, a very different time and a very different place and a very different culture. And its ways of thinking about the world are still better than the ones that we've inherited in, this, in the culture around us. So that's what we do here. We go back to this ancient, ancient text and ask ourselves, what are the resources here that can right, add to the other things we are doing to honor Earth Day? Um, and to recognize that we are coming to a time when Earth Day is either going to be every day or we're in a lot of trouble. Or maybe we're in a lot of trouble anyway. So the Psalm we read, it was an interesting translation um, that we're using with the Women's Lectionary. Blessed is the one who has the understanding of the poor. Other translations make it sound more like this is about charity, about giving things to the poor, doing things to the poor. Um, and Hebrew um, poetry is notoriously difficult to translate. Often just doesn't make straightforward sense. And so you have to try to find English words that are sort of like that. Um, and this phrase is no different. Um, but but it t it, it's about how we see things. It's not just about what we do, but whose eyes do we look out of when we look at the world? And so this, this verse says, we should be looking at the world through the eyes of the poor. It's not a matter of doing something for them, but doing something with them and trying to see the world through their eyes so that we can do things that make sense. Right? Increasingly now, people are starting to use the phrase, nothing for us without us, right? to make sure that people affected by legislation and people affected by policies are actually in the room when these decisions are made. Um, to, Right, rather than somebody else trying to talk for them, which never seems to work this way. Or another example is that the previous book the men's group was reading was all about the environmental crisis and had lots of really interesting and thoughtful things to say. But increasingly, we started to notice that his perspective was that how, how excited he got about the fact that some people were going to get really, really rich off this environmental crisis. Um, and and you know, we just, we couldn't go there because you know, that's not what we're supposed to be getting excited about here. So happy is the person who has the understanding of the poor and the reward in verse two is that God keeps her alive. It's always, right? So much of the Bible, almost all of the Bible is about this world. It's about this life. I, some days I just want to make a big poster and hang it outside the church and say, this is not about heaven. You know, heaven, yeah, you know, after death, you can worry about after death. Right now we got, we got other stuff to do. Um, and, and the Bible's right there with us, right? And so this person, right, the reward in, in the Psalm is that this person is happy in the land, not happy up in heaven or happy in their soul but happy in the land. The Bible just keeps driving us back to the reality around us. And the person in the psalmist, the psalmist recognizes that she is not yet whole. She hasn't quite got it all together. It's not, you know, happy in the land, okay, but still stuff, right? She still wants something. Heal my soul, heal my spirit, she says. But she is finally upheld for her integrity. It all fits together, right? The thoughts of her mind, right? And the, and the, the feelings in her, in her heart and, and the way she lives, this is all one package. 
this is so this is I, this is the goal that we work toward. And we just see the same sort of thing in the Deuteronomy 5 passage, right? That it's all about, it's, it's very physical. It's about the fire and the mountain. You see it get mentioned numerous times in this short passage, right? So the ancient world has a lot shorter table of elements than we have today, right? Does anyone know how many things there are in the, in the modern table of elements? Yeah, uh -huh. so you don't know is what you're saying. <laughs> okay, well, anyway, the ancient one had what? Okay, the ancient one had four, right? Earth, air, fire, and water. The world looked a lot simpler back then, apparently. And so two of them are mentioned here, right? Fire and mountain. Mountain is, is earth, right? So this is very much a faith that's connected to the basic elements of the earth. It's saying that, that this connection we have with God is also a connection we have with the world around us. It's not theology, it's experience. That our faith is like science in that way, that it starts with experience, that it starts with reality rather than with abstraction. This faith we have is a faith of dirt and rain. It's a faith of sore knees, dirty fingernails, tired feet and aching backs. When the people were standing there on the mountain, they were standing there on the mountain. And they were standing there at the mountain because they walked there. And they weren't going to stay there. So that meant they were going to walk somewhere else. Today, you can still go to these various mountains, roughly anyway, right? And you can dry, ride in the air conditioned coach and be dropped off, right, in a, in, a, in a nice resort sort of place and hang around for a while and then get back in your air conditioned coach and go. But the ancient Israelites, they didn't do it that way. And Moses by now is an old man. And so when he goes up the mountain, he probably stops to admire the view numerous times, right? That's what we say. Oh yeah, we're just gonna stop here and admire the view for a while. And it's a physical faith, faith that connects us to our world. The very basic elements of food and life and water, a life and a faith that is connected to this earth because there is no other choice. All of this stuff, all of the stuff we're going to eat either comes out of the ground or it doesn't come at all. We're not going back to Old Testament times. Back is never an option. Right? And we can't, it's not useful to think about some sort of romantic return to nature. But we need to think about moving forward to something new. And we need to understand that there needs to be an end to the great late capitalist dream. But the end of the dream does not need to be a nightmare. The end of the dream means that we need to wake up. And as we think about this and as we think about these various experiences, we need to also remember that we have, there's a limit to our own experience, that it's not just a matter of personal experience because other people observe the world differently than we do, live in different parts, think about it in different ways. Right? Again, we read that in the psalm, the understanding of the poor, the understanding of the people in, in other parts of the world. And all of this comes together in, in the Old Testament word covenant, that we live in this larger relationship with one another and with God. And this covenant has responsibilities and has rewards and it has punishments. And that, right, I get a bit uncomfortable at that point. And some of, some of you probably do too. Well, punishments, like this whole idea of God coming to punish us makes us a bit nervous now. But the reality also is that we need to start thinking about that in terms of punishments from Mother Earth. And is that really any different? That if we pour chemicals in the stream over here, the people living downstream, right? Is that a punishment from Mother Earth? Well, it's a consequence of our actions, but right? 
just a matter of recognizing that this is where we are and actions have consequences. And the Matthew story in some ways is similar, right? Matthew is deliberately trying to help you remember the Deuteronomy story. That's, that's sort of the Matthew's way of thinking about the world is Jesus equals Moses. So he wants you to he wants you to make this parallel. So when I do this, it's not some sort of artificial thing. It's like I'm I'm actually paying attention, right? And and so so Jesus is up on the mountain. You got to do this on a mountain, apparently. Now, this part of Israel, again, as I've said before, looks like West Virginia. And so like being up on a mountain is like either that or in the valley. Those are your two options. It's not like you know, not like there's a flat plain. There's a few of them in Israel, but they don't amount to much, and no Kansan would recognize any of them as a flat plain, trust me. Right? But but he goes up on this special mountain, and they have this, this special experience. And it's still a mystery, right? It's really, really physical. It's really, really concrete. And it's a mystery at the same time, right? It's right that that, that verse in Matthew is, is somewhere has become one of my favorites, right? And Jesus appeared to them, right? Let's let's get it right here. Matthew chapter 28, one of the last verses. He says, when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. What's that doing there? You know, like, how can you be looking at Jesus and doubting? And yet they were. Which is, I think, great news for those of us who are natural doubters about stuff like this. Because like, when did people start doubting the resurrection? Day three, <laughs> right? Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't just right, doubting Thomas. It was like, no, there's more of them right, who were looking at Jesus and still doubting, right? And, right, so it's again, it's always both. It's always this, this really concrete, thing of Jesus, mountain, see, hear, listen, and mystery at the same time, and, and this doubt. And Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. One of the ways that I find helpful to think this stuff through is to imagine alternative endings to that statement. Right? All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me, therefore... We notice this at love feast in John, right? Jesus knowing that he had come from God and was going back to God, right? Same sort of thing, all knowledge, all power, all authority. And in John, Jesus does what with that? Do you remember? He knew all this stuff and therefore he washes feet. That's what you do when you have all authority and knowledge. And the same sort of thing here. Jesus knows all of this stuff and has been given all of the authority, and therefore he gives the disciples a job. He could have like made them all kings, right? He could have said, "Oh, we have all authority that has rule over the earth." That'd be a sort of a more natural kind of human thing to do, wouldn't it be? I have all power, therefore let's reign. Right, and everyone is going to be our servants and do everything we tell them to do. It's going to be great, guys. Right, hot and cold running servants. It's going to be. It's going to be wonderful. All the food we can eat. And Jesus says, "No, all authority. Therefore, get to work. Right, go make disciples." Which means that people are going to have a choice. They're going to get to choose. They can say no. Go and make disciples, but not go and make, make disciples by using a, a spear, right? But try to persuade them that this is, this is the way. People get to decide, but there is still a better decision. People can continue to do stupid things if they choose to, but they're still stupid things. So Earth Day is both a celebration and a warning at the same time. We all know that already. Right? Because the current system we lived on is founded on incorrect assumptions about 
what is possible as human beings on this earth and the chances of our escaping somehow to somewhere else and that it's all going to be okay. And we know also that too often the church has been on the wrong side of this issue, continues to be on the wrong side of this issue. And I think all we can do is just continue to choose otherwise. And to, you know, when we hear people say, well, yeah, but God is going to save us all from the climate crisis. We go, yeah, maybe we got some work to do here too, right? Go and make disciples. It's part of that. So we will continue to do what we can. We will not fear the changes that are coming. But we will be ready to build strong communities that nurture and sustain our world. Amen. Our last song, number 529, let's 